um, was first established in 1968 and is an independent agency in the District of Columbia uh -oh. um, that evaluates and initiates action on matters relating to the arts and humanities and encourages programs and the development of programs that promote progress in the arts and humanities. CAH is the designated state arts agency for the District of Columbia and is supported primarily through the district government funds and in part by the National Endowment for the Arts. The first arts education project that we have that is open right now, um, otherwise known as AHEP, which is the Arts and Humanities Education Project, which offers support to qualified nonprofit arts and arts, humanities, arts education, and service organizations to deliver exemplary programs to students, teachers, educational staff, and teaching artists of DC public and public charter schools. This um, program is open to nonprofit arts organizations. The maximum award is $20,000, and the deadline is Friday, June 4th at 11.59 p.m. The next one is the Arts and Humanities Fellowship Program. Um, this is general support for funding, um, funding for artists and humanities practitioners who significantly contribute in the District of Columbia as a world-class cultural capital. Um, AHFP recognizes the impact of individual artists and humanities practitioners within the district and supports the vitality of those individuals and what they bring to the local community. Um, we have quite a few cohorts. Um, there are one pretty much for every discipline, um, but I specifically manage the one for teaching artists. And so individual DC residents are encouraged to apply. Again, we have a teaching artist cohort. The maximum award amount is $10,000. And that deadline is also Friday, June 4th at 11.59 p.m. The next one we have is field trip experiences. And FTE supports arts and humanities organizations to offer comprehensive field trip experiences for students in the district's Columbia's public schools. The scope of the grant includes the cost of the field trip, professional development opportunities for classroom educators, and the provision of pre and post field trip workshops for students. This opportunity is back. For those of you that may remember from FY20, so again, eligible applicants are nonprofit arts and humanities organizations. The maximum award amount this fiscal year is $50,000, and that deadline is a week later on Friday, June 11th at 1159 p.m. Um, as I mentioned, these grant programs officially opened on May 3rd, and so workshops and live chats have already been happening, but these are the few of the ones that are left. AHEP has a workshop next week on Wednesday, May 26th at 4 p.m., and then there is a field trip workshop coming up on Wednesday, June 2nd at 4 p.m. Both of those you can find registration information on our website, and it's a great opportunity to learn more specifically about those opportunities and what the regulations are, what paperwork you need to submit, um, and what we're looking for to help you all be successful in your applications. We also have live chats every Friday at 2 p.m. And instead of a more formalized workshop, this is really kind of virtual open hours, so to speak, where if you have any questions related to your applications or um, programs that you're thinking of applying for, um, again, they're every Friday. We have one today at 2 p.m., one next Friday, June 4th and June 11th. And recordings of all of our workshops and presentation slides are available. If you're looking for um, any of that specifically for the arts education grants, feel free to reach out to me and I'll be happy to send it to you as well. And this is just a quick list of all of the grant programs that we have open. We have about 10 programs that opened on May 3rd. Um, all of them have different award amounts. All of them have, um, there are some different requirements as far as matches and they all have different deadlines which are pretty much between June and July. And last but not least, here's my contact information. Again, I'm the Arts Learning Coordinator for DC Commission. So I specifically manage all of the arts education grants and programs. Here's my email, as well as my phone numbers where you can contact me. And also if you have general inquiries, either for the commission or for some of the other grant programs that were in that previous list, you can email cah at dc.gov 
or give a call at that number. Um, and again, we're here to so really hope help you be successful as you're crafting your applications. And specifically for the arts education programs, um, I'm definitely open to serving as a resource. And that is where I'll stop sharing my screen. Um, There's a question in the chat, Allery, um, about Story District asked if um, you could apply to field trip experiences if you're getting a GOS grant. Um, technically, yes, you can. Um, the thing you want to be careful of is just making sure that um, the requests are not repeating itself. So if you listed your field trips program in GOS, you cannot um, apply to field trips with that same program unless it's to expand it. So if you are serving more students or want to add more performances, um, the important thing is just to make sure that you're not applying for the same exact thing. Okay, so we, I'm going to turn it over to Lissa um, to say hello from the DC Collaborative. Thanks, Allery. Um, good morning, everyone. Lissa Rosenthal Yaffe, she, her from the DC Arts and Humanities Education Collaborative. It's wonderful to see so many friends from uh, DC Collaborative members to our partners at. Uh, in the public charter schools, as well as uh, DC public schools. Um, and before we get started, I just want to take a moment to thank the DC Commission on Arts and Humanities for all of their support uh, for arts and humanity, equitable access to arts and humanities learning opportunities for DC students here in the district. And that's really why we're here today. Um, and why it's so important to hear what the state of or plans as we know it are for uh, the upcoming school year so we can together as a community through, uh, through our collective work uh, provide that equitable access. And we just simply couldn't do it without the commission. And these grants are just wonderful opportunities. We're really so appreciative that the Field Trip Initiative Grant, which is really experiential learning uh, in many forms. Um, the collaborative will continue to service and support these grants uh, moving forward as we always do with all of our pivots and, and iterations uh, this past year and as we look forward to the new school year and the new opportunities for us to ensure that we are providing that equitable access. So again, wel I welcome everyone. Also really happy to see so many new community-based, DC community-based organizations participating today. Um, and I, I think that we're all gonna get such great information about how we all work together and how we can best work together in this upcoming school year. Uh, and, and to that, I'd like to hand the mic over to the DC Collaborative's Educations Manager and the creator of the Distance Learning Resource Database to talk a bit about the Field Trip Initiative uh, experiential learning uh, opportunities that the collaborative can work on with you all if you're applying. Um, and that is Trey McMichael. Thanks, Lissa. Good morning, everyone. I hope you are having a nice Friday. It's supposed to be like 90 degrees outside. So my door is closed because the AC is expensive. Um, <laughs> so it's good, good to see all you guys today. Um, Tracy, are you able to share the, uh, the slides or am I able to do that? Oh, I can share. Okay. Here we go. All right. So the DC Collaborative is prepared to support um, all of you if you're applying for the DC's, uh, the DC Commission's DOCI grant, although it is going to look a little different this year. And so I just want to review a little bit of what the services are. Um, that we're poised to support you with this year. Um, the first one is virtual experiences that are going to be synchronous. Um, so that means collaborating or marketing uh, through our lottery process, our registration process with educators, um, and a new technology that we're using this year called Event Builder. Um, an Event Builder is kind of a one-stop shop for the collaborative, um, where we're able to integrate all of our assessment um, it's a registration portal. It's where teachers and educators can go to actually engage in the, uh, the events that you're having. Um, 
And that's kind of just for, for synchronous events. Um, and we have two breakdowns for that, synchronous workshop experiences. And so things that are just for like an individual class of about maybe 20 to 25, and then synchronous assemblies. And so events that are gonna take place for more than 200 students at a time. Um, and you can see the breakdown of the, the difference in cost, whether you're a member or not a member. And then we also do on-site support um, for virtual events. For the DC Collaborative, all of our events through the end of this calendar year will only be virtual. Um, for next January through June, um, we aren't quite sure yet what our uh, capacity be will be to support in-person events, um, particularly as it relates to transportation. Um, but these services will still be able to uh, translate even once uh, things might go back in person for schools um, in terms of extracurriculars um, and out of school programs. Um, so we'll still be able to support registration and marketing and coordination of events, as well as assessment, whether it's virtual or in person. Um, the DC Collaborative is just not supporting and coordinating in-person trips through the end of the calendar year. We're also able to help with synchronous professional development um, and then asynchronous resources and events um, that would happen through our distance learning resource database. Um, and so if there's a pre-recorded video that is available asynchronously, um, that would go into the database. Whereas if there is a synchronous pre-recorded performance um, that you'd like to share with students at a specific date and time, that would be more under the synchronous assembly coordination that we do. Um, and the DAHI assessment and evaluation uh, coordination is also something that we'll be engaging with this year. Um, and that includes a report that you would get at the end of the, uh, the year next year. Um, and then we also are introducing new DAHI program consulting. And so if you need help figuring out more of the specifics about your program, about what's going to work best with students, um, figuring out curricular connections, um, even grade band, uh, that's something that you would schedule with us. And if you're a member, you'd get an hour of that consulting for free. Um, and if you're a non-member, you would get that for $50. The big difference this year um, with our DAHI services is that it's kind of, you can select what is best for you. Um, whereas before it's kind of been like, this is the DC Collaborative's DAHI menu, and this is our DAHI plan. You, if you only need assessment evaluation, you can just select that. If you only need asynchronous distance learning resource database coordination, you can just select that. And so it's really a pick and choose um, for what's gonna be best for you and your organization. Coming up in June, we'll actually be hosting three connecting to curriculum workshops um, in collaboration with DCPS Arts, Social Studies, and Early Childhood. Um, we found that these are three areas that a lot of our members have had interest in, um, especially being able to connect your programs to being more enriched with DCPS curriculum. Um, and you can register for those um, at these links. I'm not sure. I can post the link in the chat right now. I don't have it copied, but after I stop sharing my screen, okay. I'll sure to post that in there. Um, if you're interested in receiving a quote from the DC Collaborative about the DAHI services prior to submitting your application, um, we have a reopening survey to get a gauge of what are the, the resources that you might need from the Collaborative. And a part of that survey is asking you specific questions about what you might need from DAHI. Um, and so after completing that, we'll be able to create something for you that you can include in your grant application and give you an idea of what that cost would be from us. Um, so that's all I have to present. If you have any questions, feel free to, to email me, um, and schedule a meeting to chat more in depth. But thanks. Thanks, Trey. And um, for, for those of you, uh, all of our wonderful acronyms we have in our community of practice, right? Uh, so remember DAHI, for those of you that are new, is the uh, Commission's District uh, Arts and Humanities Initiative. And then FTE is the field trip. Ex and um, oh, goodness. Field trip experience. Oh, I don't know it. Someone from the Commission help me. I, I'm tripping, Allery. You're laughing. I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. But it's the same. It's it's one and the same. And I think that the it's it's really wonderful that we have this grant opportunity back. Also, the fellowship program is so important. The AHAP program, uh, up to twenty thousand uh, dollars for arts education programming. Again, really important for us in our community practice, especially. Uh, for our smaller community-based organizations uh, to be able to have all of us work collectively together. It's really important. So 
Um, so I thank everyone uh, for uh, opportunity for us to um, have you participate in our survey so we can learn as providers what you are thinking for uh, next school year and then how the collaborative also in turn can help support you in your application process to the commission. Um, to help inform us make and write up those uh, applications, uh, in our town hall today, we have some updates from our friends in the public education system. So uh, I know we have some questions that are here in the chat about uh, applications. And I think what we can do is uh, leave that for our question period at the end. Um, so uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our friend from Friendship, uh, PCS, Teriana Duran, to give an update on how the public charter schools are doing and how Friendship is doing. Good morning. I had to make sure the time was morning still. Good morning, everyone. I'm excited to be here. I see so many familiar names and uh, faces. So it's great to feel like and actually be getting back to some sense of where we used to be a year and a half ago. Um, my name is Teriana Duran and I am the Director of Arts Integration for Friendship Public Charter Schools. Uh, we are a proud partner with the Collaborative. Um, we also um, are just a lot of partners on this call, but um, beyond this call. So we're excited about all the opportunities that we benefit from and also that we can be a part of in terms of what you all um, have prepared. So I'm going to share uh, just where we are as far as Friendship Public Charter School is concerned. Um, our plans as we move forward. Um, and so we are planning. I mean, we've done a lot of planning. We've been planning probably since the beginning of the pandemic, but as you all know, things are ever changing. Um, and so just a, a little bit about us, um, our mission, you know, we wanna provide a world-class education that motivates students to achieve high academic standards, enjoy learning and develop as ethical, literate, well-rounded and self-sufficient citizens who contribute actively to their communities. Uh, we really do take our mission seriously. Um, key words, well-rounded. Um, our organization is really big on choice and opportunity. And so when you look at friendship, you see that opportunity, you see that ability to make a choice, you see um, being able to intentionally select the type of education you wanna receive within our campuses. And so if you want to have an early college experience, you have that. If you want an IB experience, you have that. If you want an arts experience, you have that. We want our kids to have choices. We want them to have opportunities. We want them to go to college. And we want them to, you know, preferably go to college for free, however that looks. If that's through the arts, great. If that's through athletics, great. If that's through academics, great. But we definitely promote um, family choice. So beginning in 1998, we started with just two locations. Um, Friendship has now 16 campuses, um, including online for students in grades pre-K through 12. Uh, this week, we recently uh, acquired um, Hope Lamont charter school, which is directly across the street from our current ideal campus. And so that plan is to have one location as like our early childhood center. And we have a Reggio program, our second Reggio program there. And then the other campus will be our uh, upper school, uh, middle school. Um, so we offer rigorous curriculum, exemplary instruction, resource rich forums, total commitment to student advancement, one of DC's top charter systems, Premier Early College Arts and Athletic Programs. We're super proud of our brand new uh, football field that um, our you know, award conference winning football program has won many conferences without a football field. They call it the beach because it was very sandy, but now we are proud to say that that is a completed project and um, it's beautiful. And then as I mentioned, the acquisition of Hope Lamont Charter School. So let's talk a little bit about our arts program specifically. Um, really has always been a major uh, force within Friendship. I actually have been with Friendship since 2003. I taught music for 13 years, uh, assistant principal for two, and then in my current position since 2018. So I am the director of arts integration, which um, beyond just obviously me benefiting from this position, I think it's a super cool thing that this organization deems it important enough to have a director of arts 
in a charter school setting. And so I'm proud of that. Um, I'm proud of that decision. Uh, we are dedicated to uh, our arts. We did acquire City Arts in 2018. That's the charter school, that was former charter school. And so we have a dedicated arts program at our Armstrong campus. Uh, we offer visual art, music, vocal and instrumental, dance, theater, and graphic design. We also have pre-AP and AP courses within many of those disciplines. Um, we have over 30 art staff, which for us is really a um, big and uh, awesome accomplishment. Um, it's, you know, as you know, probably hard to have more than one arts teacher in the school, but we're proud to say that many, many of our campuses, we made a, a decision, our board made a decision uh, around that 2018 timeframe that at, at minimum, there would be music and art at every campus. That was already pretty much the case, but that definitely has to be a uh, consistent um, offering. But we also have, in addition to that, dance and theater at almost all of our campuses. Um, we offer after-school enrichment and summer enrichment arts camps. Um, and those are really uh, large, well-attended. We are already planning for this summer. Um, our uh, summer, this will be, our summer enrichment this year will be in person. Um, and we already have probably about, it's not like it used to be. Usually we have about 250 kids, it's, but it's a good number to say that, you know, parents are making the decision whether they wanna transition back or not. Um, and so we're planning, we're moving forward. Uh, we have an arts advisory board. Um, and so we uh, are meeting with them often. They are guiding us, they're helping us with partnerships and they are a wonderful resource to have. Uh, we have had partnerships and con continued par partnerships with Shakespeare Theater. They've offered uh, professional development for our staff. We have professional development time embedded into our schedule um, weekly, uh, where we have an early release, uh, Busboys and Poets, as well as New Works Production and many more. Um, and then we have an annual arts festival. It's a huge festival that we do at the end of the year where all of our campuses come together and showcase the best arts programming that they've had all year. So what does 2021-22 look like for our instruction? We're offering three models. In-person will be obviously the traditional model that is our full-fledged plan for uh, August. Five days a week, we'll still have our early release day. We don't have the specific day yet. Um, we will offer before and after care. We will offer extended day programming. Our sports will be back in place. Summer learning will be back as it already is. And then there will be a teacher of record in all the classrooms. So we are planning for a full in-person five-day schedule for next school year. We will still offer distance learning, um, but it will be an all virtual experience. So there will be no hybrid opportunities. This will be five days per week. They will also have an early release schedule summer learning experience, sports, LEA grade level content teacher um, assigned by quarter. And so the notification window, they can only change over if they choose after the semester. Um, and then the modified schedule. Okay, and then we also obviously have our K through eight and nine through 12 online programming, um, which has already been in place. Um, K through eight online campus in person one day per week. And then um, at our collegiate academy, one person, uh, one day per week as well in person. What does success in a pandemic look like for us? Over the past year and a half, um, you, we definitely didn't shy away from the limitations. We, we recognized that there would be. Um, and so we just tried to, uh, you know, create what we could in the midst of what we were dealt. And so we were still able to partner with some um, organizations. We uh, started with Arts Laureates. I'm not sure if you're familiar with them. They're really big on the virtual choir. Um, and then we also partnered with a private company out of Baltimore who, who really um, helped us finish out the year. And so we were able to produce virtual dance recital at our Armstrong campus. We're really proud of that. Um, many of you probably heard about me talking to heard about this last year, or maybe not last year, two years ago, because this is how long we've been trying to execute this music festival, because um, I was in person. Um, so we got a grant, uh, and uh, we were proud of that, and we had to keep pivoting and changing the scope of what this would look like because of the pandemic. And so finally in February, I am so proud that we were able to execute this citywide vocal music festival called Sounds Through Friendship. 
Um, and it was a success. And it was such a success that um, when we had our, our follow-up meeting with our grantor, they wanted us to definitely consider doing this as an annual event and they want us to actually expand. And so um, we're currently, you know, discussing possible opportunities for additional funding and all of that. And uh, regardless, we're going to most likely make it work regardless of what happens with any further grant funds. Um, we uh, also received another grant. Our, one of our staff members at our Woodridge campus applied and won and was able to put on a, vir a visual art virtual showcase, which was amazing. It was all, you know, not just our, our friendship staff. It was a citywide um, DCPS teachers were also included and it was an amazing event. So we were proud of that. And then we were also able to still continue our virtual student recitals and master classes um, specifically at our Armstrong campus, which again is our, our arts focused campus. So at this time, I will show you just a few, let me stop share and then share again, um, just a little snippets of our, our virtual arts festival. So that, uh-oh, not sure. Can you all see this? No, we can't see it. Okay, hold on. Let me get to the right screen, sorry. This is always the issue. <laughs> uh, let's see. Bear with me one second. Okay, let me try this again. Oh, here we go. All right, how about that? Yeah, looks good. Okay. Now let me make sure the sound is right. Okay, it is. All right. So I'm gonna be like kind of moving through because you're not, you know, it's a long event, but I just wanted to give you Carter School Little bit of Arts Department. Welcome to the Voices Through Friendship Virtual Vocal Music Festival. My name is Tariana Duran, and I'm the Director of Arts Integration for Friendship Public Charter School. Through the it's going to buffer a little bit, but I do want you to see. <laughs> So we went from the youngest kind of to we will now have Armstrong Elementary oldest, and Middle it's, Schools it's Ensemble. We had some cameo appearances from some familiar faces. Hero and Gotta Be, directed by Bianca Jones and John Kennebrew. Don't break my 
We had um, participants from Oxon Hill Middle School. This is one of our, from our Southeast Academy. Showing the diversity of how we try to include all genres. hoping to capture oh, this young name. lady's amazing. Floyd Probably is different, but yet the same. GG, you should be proud. Your yeah. daddy didn't change your game. Say her name. She's a congested. I'm suggesting Breonna Taylor's killers be arrested with no question. So definitely check her out. Um, just to give you an idea, we did have uh, some cameos from Verdine White. Neo and uh, Wang Ye Morris from Boys to Men also. I didn't happen to stop on any of those, but it was a really cool opportunity. Um, I'm super proud of this project because it was definitely a labor of love. It showed how we persevered. The teachers, oh my gosh, without them, this would not have been possible because the amount of um, time and energy they put into getting the students to where they could even, you know, be heard and continuing to send back and give feedback. I need you to re-record. I need you to, you know, use these type of headphones. That was a really, really hard task. It seems kind of easy, but in a pandemic with all types of different resources and what kids did and didn't have, you know, we're just super proud. And we know only from here, it's gonna get better and better. And imagine what it will look like in person next year. So we're super excited. I uh, just wanted to give you a snippet of what we were able to accomplish in a pandemic. And um, we look forward to working with you. I will post in the chat like our specific needs and um, how you can reach me as well. That's it for me. Wow. Wow, everyone's applause. Yes, let's put up our hands. Wow, that was so cool. Thank you for sharing. That Tariana and friend and you and your leadership at Friendship, really stellar and just such wonderful teachers. So bravo! Thank you so much. Um, now we're going to hand the mic over to our other awesome arts leadership at DCPS uh, Central Office, Mary Lambert, who's also on the board of the DC Collaborative and the co-chair of our Any Given Child. Collective Impact Steering Committee. Uh, Any Given Child DC, for those of you that are not familiar, is a collective impact initiative that the collaborative uh, provides backbone support to. Uh, it's for our entire arts and humanities education community of practice and uh, is focused on DC public schools to start, but a lot of the data that we collect also includes charter schools. So uh, handing the mic now over to Mary Lambert for an update on how things are going at DCPS and what our, the planning looks like uh, as we move into the fall. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Um, I, I hear all of you. They're saying that you were crying during watching the, the children's performances. I am such a sucker for kids singing and performing. I become, you know, just a bawling mess every time I watch it. Um, so thank you for sharing that, Tariana. All right, let me try to share my screen and hopefully it will go seamlessly. Um, presenting with me today is the lovely and fierce Thomas and Franken as well. So um, she will be chiming in. She's from our partnership group and we'll have uh, some great information to help everyone with what we have for information at this point, I think is the key thing, maybe to lower the bar on some of the expectations of information we have to share. <laughs> um, so uh, one of the, the main areas I wanna direct you all to is the arts website for DCPS. It is artsdcps.com. You will find updates that we share with our community, curriculum, um, any of the posts that we put up for our teachers are there. Some of it's password protected, um, but you'll be able to keep in touch with what all is coming up, up with us there as well. 
Um, we have our uh, end of year virtual showcase coming up as well. So in a typical in-person year, we have six different in-person events for the virtual arts, performing arts, and music. Um, and since we couldn't be in person this year, <clears throat> we are, we've created a virtual reality showcase. So we're taking artwork, um, we were really fortunate to have over 1100 submissions of art pieces, um, which we felt was just a really powerful uh, point to the fact that the arts is still happening. You know, our teachers are struggling to keep their classes going, keeping kids in the class when a lot of times it's not a mandated course during the virtual world, or it's, you know, relegated to the asynchronous day versus the synchronous day or any of those types of things. But our kids really are turning to the arts to heal and to work through their ideas and what's happening in their community and in their world. So we have taken all those submissions and this virtual reality showcase. Um, so I'm going to show you a little video, but it is created in Hubs Mozilla. So it's something that you can do on your own as well. Um, we did thankfully hire somebody to help us with it that has a uh, much stronger engineering uh, skills than us. And that is a, a group called Genesis Steam and in partnership with the Hirschhorn as well. And we had a group of 12 students design the space and when you go in, you can create your own avatar and you will walk through a Washington DC metro station where you will see all the artwork on the walls and on trains going by. And then at the end of the metro station, you walk out and there will be a stage in an outdoor DC block uh, that then shows you a reel of all of the performances. Um, and then on our artsdcps.com will be the full layout of all of the artwork. So even anything that didn't make it into the showcase um, and then the full video of all of the performances will be available there too. Uh, so let's see, hopefully this will play with sound. Let me know with thumbs up or thumbs down if you would, Tracy, if you hear sound and all, okay. That was, let me go forward, get out of there. <laughs> and that one so it doesn't play again. Um, there will be a chance for partners to come in and see the full showcase as well. So it's launching uh, June 1st. And on June 1st and 2nd, we are going to have special times for um, our DCPS internal leadership to see everything as well as our partners to have sign up too. Um, I am just waiting on the links from Genesis Steam. So as soon as I get those, I will get those emails out to everyone. Um, and uh, But you can go ahead and put a, a temporary hold on your calendar if you want, uh, June 1st and 2nd from 10 to 12 uh, a.m. each day, 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. each day. Uh, we will have those showcases available for people to, for our partners to come in and see it. Um, and then after that, it launches to all the schools to do their field trips to come in and then families at, at night as well. So what's coming up this summer? Um, we have some PD that we're gonna offer. Uh, we have a, with Teach, um, Teach for Change, they have a program called Teach the Beat, which is a go-go professional development we're doing. Um, that is a full day prefer, uh, professional development in August. And then we are working with um, the Hirschhorn on a program called She Speaks, which is um, ensuring that uh, all of the art that we do close study work in our programs is representative of women, um, whether in art or made by art or both. Um, and then we are also launching um, an art history program with one of the professors from Howard that is uh, basically um, what you didn't learn in your art history program. <laughs> so uh, getting everyone up to date and having something that is beyond, you know, the the Van Gogh and the Degas artwork, um, uh, broadening our world through through art history. 
Um, as I'm sure many of you have heard, uh, coming up next year is the year of Alma Thomas, um, NGA, the Phillips, um, Imagination Stage, and DC Public Libraries have all partnered up and are creating a lot of really wonderful um, uh, connections. Uh, preparing for Alma Thomas's uh, birthday in September. There will be several events around the city with that as well, and DCPS is involved with that. Um, this summer, we are redesigning our units. So any of the teaching artists who've tried to do connections to our units and had to look through 10 different files, I apologize profusely. <laughs> we are making that much easier process, um, and that will all be launched uh, beginning of September on the artsdcps.com website for you to see as well, too. Uh, within that redesign, we are adding seed work, which is social emotional academic development, basically intentionally using SEL throughout our units, um, stronger resources, we are creating keyboard method books with uh, Washington Performing Arts, and then um, elementary through high school, we offer the Adobe Creative Cloud for our students. So we're going to do, in, along with Soundtrap and Smart Music as well, excuse me, and we are doing um, uh, pathways or intentional supports within digital art and digital music for all of our units as well, so that teachers have the option to do um, uh, traditional art forms or uh, a more modern digital format. So what we know <laughs> for next year, um, uh, we know that in-person learning, IPL is in-person learning, is the expectation. Um, however, we are going to offer virtual. Uh, the specifics of that are being worked out right now internally. Um, so as soon as we know what how much that will be, if it is a separate school, if it's a part of the, the schools itself, what it will be, um, that will be launched by the chancellor um, as soon as possible. Um, I'm sure you've seen that we have the ESSER funds to support reopening, so to make sure that all of our classrooms are, um, are healthy and safe for our students and our partners when they're welcomed back in. We will have before and after school, thankfully. Um, current guidelines for the fall show that there is um, no distancing or cohort requirements since you know the expectation is that all students are back. Um, however, that could obviously change at any point based on uh, what's happening within uh, you know, COVID numbers and, and, and what the mayor requires and the CDC requires. Students in grades three through 12 will have one-to-one -one, uh, computers devices. And for the lower grades, it'll be uh, slightly less than one-to-one, -one, like three-to-one or two-to-one, uh, depending on how the numbers work out. So the ability for the seamless virtual and in-person uh, will be available. Uh, class schedules should be back to normal. We don't have um, any specific language around that as far as, um, you know, if there's going to be a change or what that exactly looks like. However, we are currently planning back to the regular in-person style of scheduling. So, um, and then uh, you probably have seen, there was the email that ran out this past week uh, about the new partner requirements. Um, we'll dive, dive into that in a little bit. Um, and we will try our best to answer any questions at the end after this. And I'm going to hand it over to Ms. Franken. Hey, um, I'm unmuting. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm here to provide a few updates that we do have. Um, uh, we did send out a a newsletter last week to our partners, uh, basically uh, sharing that there are new clearance requirements uh, for individuals who are working with students. Um, so there is a drug and alcohol test requirement. Um, and then also when you do your, enter your application and get your fingerprints done, uh, you don't have to do anything extra, but automatically everyone will have their, um, the, the child protection registry checked and the sex offender registry checked to see if uh, you're in there. Um, and then just as always, we have the fingerprints and the TV screen. Um, so this is a lot of new stuff. We're gonna be sending out another newsletter today. And I think we're going to be having a um, webinar or you know, a meeting online um, with our clearance team for partners so that you guys can get all your questions answered because I certainly don't have them all. Um, and we wanna make sure you have an opportunity to ask the experts. Next slide. Is there anything else?
Oh yeah. And then <laughs> um, kind of like Mary said, you know, we don't know what next year is going to look like yet. Um, so we have, uh, you know, stuff in the works. We're still thinking about it. And obviously um, we will be sharing out once we have the information and it's, and it's set. Thank you. Thank you all. I will stop sharing so I can see questions as well. Um, thank you so much, Mary. Um, looks like we have a few minutes left. So Tracy, I know you reported some questions. Um, and so maybe we start with those that were already written and then we can kind of open it up to anyone that may want to unmute and ask a question. Um, and please continue writing in the chat as well. Sure, so Edward Evans wrote, how long will it, uh, back in um, your presentation, Allery, um, how long will it take for funding to be granted if selected? Um, good question. And you can reach out to me directly. Um, it, you know, the funding announcements will be made in October. Um, and then sort of after that, if you are selected, it really kind of depends on how quickly your paperwork gets in <laughs> and some of those more logistical details. So you can reach out to me directly and we can talk about um, a specific timeline, but it will be sometime this fall. Um, and then um, uh, Jared wrote um, to ask if this workshop counted towards the pre-application training in order to apply. Good question. Um, this does not count. <laughs> um, this was a resource that we, you know, offered to people hoping to help them in their planning of programming, um, but the DC commission workshops, grant workshops are specifically required. And that's really for field trips specifically. Um, for AHEP and for the fellowship, it is not required, but for field trips. So if any of you have not attended a field trip workshop yet and are planning to apply, you do need to attend the one coming up the first week of June. Um, for AHEP and for fellowships, I know fellowships specifically, all of those workshops have already happened. So as I mentioned, um, if you still wanna get that information, you can reach out to myself or to the commission office and someone will be able to send you um, the slides and the presentation. Thanks, Valerie. And if you have follow-up, um, please jump in <laughs> before I go on to the next one. Yeah. Uh, Was that the end uh, of the written um, questions, Tracy? Um, uh, you have before. There's a second part to something that Angela uh, Angelisa asked, and I think I might need your help too, Allery. Um, so uh, she asked about if the virtual experience support from the collaborative will continue in the next calendar year. And Trey answered that, like our virtual programming is here to stay. But the second part of her question was, can organizations offer both in-person and virtual events to students in the next calendar year? Um, I know that the commission grant require like the grant is allowing for in person, um, uh, but regarding like the uh, scope change forms or uh, any changes, if you can um, uh, like talk about uh, that part of it. Yeah. So I mean. You're right. So aligning in terms of what's allowable for a grant application, um, we are open. And, you know, an organization can decide to, let's say, do an in-person performance, but maybe a virtual workshop. Um, but those kind of details um, really should, you know, be aligned with what's happening at the schools, as well as what may be realistic for you, you know, in your organization. Um, and so if you have that question and want to talk more, you know, feel free to reach out to me directly. And again, the collaborative is now offering cons consultation in terms of crafting programs. Um, but, you know, as I think it's been mentioned a few times, we're also trying to figure out what makes sense um, in aligning with the transition back to in-person while still realizing that there's some value with, you know, virtual programming as well. Um, but technically, yes, as long as it's properly outlined in your application and reflected in the budgets, um, it's possible. Okay, and now we're um, up to present. I guess there are some more written ones in the chat. Yeah. 
So, um, Lacey, I, oh, I think, oh, go ahead, Ellery. Do you see? Oh, something? yeah, I was going to say, I think it starts with Lacey. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and this is a question for DCPS. Um, so Thomason or Mary, um, Lacey was asking about uh, proof of vaccination for DCPS staff. I don't think so, Mary, right? They're not required. Not I've heard. It's highly encouraged, but not, yeah. You're not checking or, or you know, to prove it. At least not at this point. <laughs> um, okay, thank you. And then after Lacey, Looks like it's Danielle. Um, she has a question about the DCPS clearance letter that is usually two years. Um, and does that need to be repeated um, for all of the, I'm assuming, new background check requirements? I don't know. Um, so that's a good question for the uh, uh, people when we have the, the webinar coming up. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Daryl, yes, if you email me, I can send you those slides. And I can put my email in the chat. Um, no, I believe you had your, I saw you unmute yourself. <laughs> I don't know if you still have that. Yeah. I I did. Um, and, and um, you know, just with the uh, sort of, uh, con you know, challenge uh, surrounding um, this fall um, and the virtual space, I, I maybe this is obvious or uh, I'm sorry if, uh, if it is, but the question uh, surrounding field trips and uh, travel for students, I mean, is the idea that many of these things will still be held virtually as a virtual field trip or is it will people will be physically going to places as in a normal year. Um, is that for the collaborative or for DCPS? Sorry. No. Uh, well, oh. I, 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 it's a good question. I'm not entirely <laughs> sure. I'm not entirely sure. I guess DCPS uh, maybe is uh, leaning more towards uh, um, in person. So it sounds as though maybe things would be back to normal in terms of uh, uh, travel, um, but uh, but I mean I guess it's just a general question regarding the the, the grant um, and and what um, what people are thinking about in terms of that piece of it before the new year. Um, so the DC Collaborative um, is definitely encouraging virtual programs, um, uh, virtual field trips uh, for the the fall and probably the winter too. Um, uh, we will not be supporting um, transportation logistics um, because of uh, safety requirements and there's a, a, a lot unknown still. Um, though we can still provide um, logistics and registration assistance, um, or we will not be booking the uh, transportation. Um, and then I know this, uh, this was a question in the chat too, and Allery, feel free to jump in after me, but I know that uh, transportation costs are not allowable in the in this year's grant. Is that correct? Yeah, and Mary, maybe you can talk a little bit about this as well. Um, you know, it was my thought, I think that earlier this summer there was, or it hasn't quite been summer yet, but earlier this year, um, there was a thought that, you know, students would not be getting on buses and metroing. And, you know, there was priority, I guess, maybe for the summer programming about having partners come into the schools and less about the traveling. So I know you all don't have any official um things, I guess, set on that based on your slides. Um, but my thought is that, you know, the idea is to be pretty conservative, even into going into this new year. And I'm um, assuming that there's some, you know, rollout that needs to happen with even getting so many of the schools back, um, that putting kids on buses and actually traveling all throughout the city um, is probably less likely on the priority list. Um, and you can certainly chime in on that. But I know those are our thoughts as well at the commission. And particularly since, you know, in uh, previous field trip years, we use the collaborative as a great partner for that. And they're not doing that. Um, we kind of anticipate that that would not be happening as well. Um, but if you have any thoughts um, 
um, or Tariana, any thoughts about, you know, what you guys anticipate, um, even if it's not official? Sure. Everything is changing so fast because when I said being more on the conservative side a couple of weeks ago, that was before, you know, everybody took their masks off. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I would say that what you're saying is is correct in that maybe less about transmission of the virus, but more of that schools are just going to need a moment to collect their thoughts and their process and get back into the swing of things um, where in regular years, they could maybe start doing field trips in the first month. Um, I would imagine that they probably will be slower for that. Uh, and then some schools may be definitely more conservative just for the virus purposes, especially anyone under 12 and is not able to get vaccinated yet. Um, so it, it's a little bit of a wait and see, um, but yeah, plan A and plan B as much as you can. I know we're all tired of doing that, but. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and Rachel, I see your question. So it's not like officially a not allowable cost in terms of if you read the deadline, um, the guidelines, um, it's just more about us encouraging organizations to be realistic in their planning um, and not necessarily anticipating, you know, busing 600 school kids to from schools into another location. Um, so, you know, we have more official, official non-allowable costs. And if there's something that, you know, you're really thinking of, you know, feel free to reach out to me and we can talk it through. But just based on what we've been hearing in conversations, um, especially with the collaborative, we just don't anticipate buses being a major factor, um, especially as they were in previous field trip years. So I probably would suggest not <laughs> planning for it, um, but it's not like an official non-allowable cost, if that makes sense. Yeah. And also, this is Lisa here from the collaborative, just to add on super brief. Uh, you know, we we are erring on, on the side of, of, of great caution, but also the collaborative traditionally is quite nimble and flexible. Uh, so when we look to say spring of next year, uh, you know, we may, um, we're constantly tracking and in alignment with all of our partners. Um, and we're looking at new models for transportation uh, services for the future. Um, but we just know it's, it's best to err on the side of uh, conservative caution, certainly for fall and most likely for winter as well. But Terion, I saw that you uh, turned off your mic. Did you wanna share a bit about where friendship is as an example of what some of the charter schools are thinking? Yeah, it's pretty much in alignment with what Mary was saying. Um, I know as of today, I haven't heard anything different. I'm sure that will change, but like we have been in a policy of just like no visitors, even in our in, in our buildings at all. And, and so, I'm sure that will change and it probably will change as early as the start of our summer programming, um, but I'm just not sure. And so I need to talk with our chief of schools, you know, and make sure that is a change. And then what has to happen with visitors as they come in, what's the process? We're still establishing all of those protocols. And so like Mary said, it's like, we kind of just need to transition from what we've been doing to now that we are going to be fully back um, in person, what does that look like? And it's not that the planning hasn't started. It's just now that it's actually happening, we have to filter through all of the things that will happen once we start to get everyone back in the building um, on a consistent basis. And of course, partners, visitors comes after scholars, staff, and all of that. And so it's coming. Uh, we just don't know exactly what that looks like. But for my understanding as of today, we still have a no visitor policy. So that's where we are. Thanks, Mariana. And I know that this, you know, doesn't quite align with the grant deadlines, which are due in, <laughs> in like two weeks. Um, but, you know, the commission will continue to, you know, remain responsive and, you know, flexible. It's really just about the communication and letting us know what's happening, you know, with your programs and what changes may need, you know, what may need to be shifted. Um, but we realize that even though the pandemic might be more officially over that the transition and, you know, what we all are going through kind of post pandemic will continue. So that's where the interim reports come in and just constant communication, you know, just in case things are changing. 
Um, I'm going to be mindful of time. There's one question here that I think has kind of been lingering. So I think that will just be our last question. Um, and then, of course, if there's anything else, you know, feel free to reach out to all of us um, as you all are continuing thinking of what to offer. Um, and for me, working on your applications that are due um, in a few weeks. So um, I see a question that says, if I have new teaching artists going into DCPS for in-person learning this summer, will they be expected to complete the new requirements now or will those be added before the next school year? Yes, they will be expected to do it now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I think that will be it. Lisa, do you have any closing? Remarks? There's a question, Allery, for um, Reginald said about hybrid experiences. I think he had a question early, higher up in the. Uh, what are thoughts on hybrid programs, a virtual play experience with pre or post in person interaction? Does that feel feasible for schools or in unnecessary hurdle? Um, I think that's a to be determined, Reginald. I think that it'll be, it, if people can be in person, I think that it, it sounds wonderful and it might be school by school and if they're gonna allow it or not. Um, I don't think it sounds unnecessary, but because in person is definitely better in a lot of ways. So if, if we can make it happen, yes. 